Well, Happy New Year, church family. It is, yeah, man. It is so good to see you all. I can't think of another state where you can radically change degrees by 50 within a matter of, what, an hour? This is insane. Um, I, I, I thought I was promised that when I moved from Minnesota down to Texas that this would not happen. And whoever promised that has been um, just been completely revealed as a liar. So every year it is snowed, and every year it gets really cold. So good thing it's only a moment. But that's not what you're here to hear me bickering and, bickering and complaining about the weather. My um, name is Brandon Ziski, the lead pastor here at Austin Oaks Church. I love when we get together as one family. We get these opportunities to see everybody in our church because we're spread out. This is a beautiful glimpse, just a small, infinitesimal taste of what heaven is like, being able to worship with all generations, different cultures. And I even love the fact that we have Nueva Vida with us, and we also have Pastor Charles for Rwanda with us this morning, um, bringing God's word. But I wanted to share a few things that's on my heart as we start this series, as we start this year, and also to pray a blessing over us as a church, um, because I'm a big fan of New Year's, I'm a big fan of New Year resolutions and all kind of stuff. And so what I wanted to do to start out this year was to kind of launch this series called Close the Gap, from where we want to be to where we want to where we know we should be. This isn't like a self-help series. This is a spiritual formation, three-week kind of shot in the arm, trying to listen again to the promptings, the stirrings, the hunger that's inside of us that God has caused to be in our hearts. Philippians 1.6, that he who began a good work in you will complete that. And if you are a follower of Jesus, he's deposited his very spirit inside of you, and his spirit is passionate about conforming you more and more into the likeness of his son, Jesus. And our job is to partner with him in that, to move along in the process of sanctification, and it's a mystery. Now, if you've been following Jesus, you know exactly what I'm talking about. There's sometimes those burdens and those aches where you go, man, I've fallen short. I know I should be. I know I want to be. All of those things, I believe, are the Holy Spirit stirring inside of us. And that's what we want to look at these three weeks. How do we close the gap? Paul writes in Philippians chapter 2, verses 12 through 13. Therefore, my dear brothers, as you, as you have always obeyed, not only in my presence, but now much more in my absence, continue to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. We don't earn our salvation. We work it out in partnership with the Holy Spirit. For it is God who works in you to will and to act according to his good purpose. He's putting desires and longings inside of your heart. And my prayer for us as a church is that we learn how to hear the Holy Spirit, how to recognize those prompts that he's caused to be stirring inside of us. And so before we invite Pastor Charles up, I want to pray just a blessing over us as a church, as a challenge, and asking the Lord to have his way in our hearts in 2022. Oh my goodness, that is so weird to say out loud. So if you're the type of person, I'd encourage you just to kind of like have your hands out to receive a blessing. Blessings are a big deal in God's word and the community of God. And so I want to pray that you would receive this blessing. Father, as we come to you January 2nd, 2022, and just thinking over the last year, God, I know that many of us will look at that year and say, there's regrets. There are things that I wish... I didn't do, I, I wish there were things that didn't happen, but Lord, in the midst of that, I pray that we are able to see your faithfulness and your goodness. God, I pray for us as a church that you would stir up and strengthen our faith by grace, that we would believe that the best is yet to come. God, I pray for our church and our people in this church and our families and our neighbors and our friends that they would experience a season of deep renewal, of revival in their spirits, in their homes. God, I pray for the church, not just Austin Oaks, but the churches across the world, the churches in America, that we would be sensitive to your spirit. Give us a heart of conviction to obey you, to stand on truth, to stand in grace, to reflect the beauty of your son, Jesus. 
God, I pray, Lord, that we would be people, that you would give this church, these people in this room and online and those who aren't with us, ears to hear your spirit. Give them the conviction to obey. Restore unto us the joy of our salvation. Father, I pray that you would use this church in powerful ways to show the lost in this world, in our culture, Jesus. If anything we can see in 2021, God, we've seen how you have revealed the brokenness of our world and that there's a better way. Father, for my friends, my brothers and sisters in this room who know exactly in their hearts where they have fallen short and where they want to be, Father, I pray that through the power of your Holy Spirit, it would be so. God, do something in our day, in our time, that we would have to see to believe. We give this church to you. We recognize, Jesus, that you are the head. Be glorified here, now. And also, Lord, we also want to pray for those who are battling COVID. To not be remiss on that, we pray that you'd protect hearts, revive their health, Lord, we pray for our brothers and sisters in the medical world. Lord, that you would give them grace upon grace. And Lord, we do pray that you would eradicate this illness in the name of Jesus. And all God's people said, amen. Now I want to ask Pastor Charles to come on up. And I do want you to know a little bit about this guy. Um, and, I, and I'll say this every time you come up here. But... Truly, the Lord has used this man in remarkable ways. We get these little glimpses to hear his heart. But when you walk on the streets where he calls home in Rwanda, you really get to see how God uses someone's simple yes of obedience. It is truly such an honor for you to bless us with the words that you're going to allow God to speak through you. I am um, excited for what Pastor Charles is going to share with you. I'm not going to let the cat out of the bag, but he's going to preach on prayer. <laughs> I just did that. But it's so important for us, especially as we start this year on there. Um, Pastor Charles, I want to say in front of everybody, just for myself personally, you've become a great pastor to me. Thank you, Pastor. A great friend to me. One of the things you don't know that this guy has done for me the last three years, he's walked alongside of me. He's been a constant source of encouragement. And he comes as we talk business and shop. He immediately just stops and he just prays blessings over you as a church and over me as a pastor. And so, Pastor Charles, thank you so much you. for not just doing this, but really embodying this as a lifestyle. And so one of the things that you're going to hear in the days to come is that we are planning a trip to Rwanda, and uh, Pastor Charles has shared the good news as we are waiting for the building permit because we raised the money to build the next church in Rwanda, that the building permit went through. So now we actually have a date as to when we are actually going to Rwanda. So for those of you who have been like, man, we want to go, but what's the date? We have the date. June 20th is when we're going to go. And man. it's going to be roughly 28th to 29th. We'll come back. But that's going to be when we celebrate the grand opening of the new church mm -hmm. that God has caused you to be generous to contributing in our means of partnering with, with um, African New Life. Also, so we're going to have that, but also one of the things that we're going to do, because um, we've um, planted that church in Karangazi in partnership, yep. there's an additional 17 kids in that area of Karangazi that need to be sponsored. And I told Pastor Charles in, in the crew of African New Life that this Sunday, our church, there will be people in this church or online that are going to feel the prompt of God to sponsor those 17 kids. So I want to encourage you, prayerfully consider that. Um, if you come to Rwanda in June, we'll be going to Karangazi, so you'll be able to meet those kids. I want to encourage you to do that. There's going to be an email that will be sent out after the service that will give you the link as to where you can sponsor those 17 kids. And so, Pastor Charles, such an honor. You got two hours. Do your thing. Oh. <laughs> Unload your heart. We'll take it. They don't need to hear from me. Uh, so thank, thank you. you so much. Well, thank you, Pastor Brandon. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to, to be here today. In fact, when I was about to land into Austin, uh, these days you can text from the sky. It's a new day. 
I told pastor, I'm coming to Austin. We are having our Christmas celebrations here because my kids go to college this side of the state. And pastor said, can you come and preach for us? I said, oh, yes. And he said, no pressure. Do you really want? I said, I really want. This place has become my second home here in Austin. We've been able to find a great relationship. I want to thank you so much for your years of supporting African New Life Ministries. It's, it's incredible that you sponsor, I think, over 400 children now in Rwanda. Not only that, last year, 2020, you helped us plant a church, a nice building church. Now it's full of people praising God. A new church is under construction, and by April, it's going to be done. And when you guys come in June, we're going to have a grand opening of another church in the communities of Rwanda in a place called Nyamagami. So, thank you for your mission of spirit and your outreach to the nation of Rwanda. I want to make a quick prayer here. Father, in Jesus' name, standing on the prayer Pastor Brandon has just made, I do ask you to help me, to allow me to bring a message from you to speak to us this morning as we start this year. Father, I pray that you put in your fire in our hearts for us to be on fire for you and to the glory of your name that we will bring a revival in our days. In the name of Jesus, amen. Amen. Okay. Now, if there is anything I prayed for, I have asked God again and again, a God in my days, when I'm still alive, bring a revival. I want to be part of God's mighty move of the Spirit on this planet in my life, not after I'm gone, Lord. Lord, when I'm here, you know, some people have, see, uh, have prayed for revivals and have seen revivals after they've gone to heaven. They don't get to see them, they'll hear the stories. But you know, I'm praying, God, I want a revival. While I am here, I want to experience your presence and your goodness while I'm here on earth. Today, I want to talk on what I've called how to find a new fire in this year. Now, normally I love to preach, but today I really want to get a little bit slow and try to explain to you my heart about revival and about what God is, is doing, how to find a new fire in this new year. If there is any resolution you want to make it this year, would you please include this one? Finding a new fire for the Lord in your heart this year. That's a super resolution for the year. Uh, I want to start by a story. Uh, and the story is that once there lived a, a, a village atheist in a small village, a man who never believed in God, and he said there is no God. And this sounds like a small English village. I've been to so many English villages in my life, from Cambridge to Huntingdon to, to Manchester to, to so many English villages. I preached in England for many years. He was not interested in, in the church, and he was the only one known atheist in his area. There was only one church in that village. That church in the village was a very cold and a dead church. It was more of a social club with no decisions being made for Christ. There was no growth. It was just a church for the name's sake of being called a church. And we know many of those. And one day, the church building caught on fire. And the whole town ran towards the church to help extinguish the fire, real fire, physical fires. And guess who came? Including the atheist 
in the village, because some of those villages are small, came to help extinguish the fire at the church. Someone saw the atheist running towards the church and shouted out, Hey, this is something new for you. The first time I've seen you running to the church. He replied, This is the first time I have seen the church on fire. And he ran. Friends, my desire is that the church will be on fire and not obviously a, a, a physical fire, little of fire, but a fire of the spirit. Because when the fire of the spirit is in the church, people run to the church. They are unstoppable. Listen to the characteristics of the church on fire. I want to start by reading Genesis chapter 22, verse 7. And we want to look at Abraham. Genesis 22, verse 7, Isaac spoke up and said to his father Abraham, and he said, Father, yes, my son, Abraham replied. And he said, the fire and the wood are here, Isaac said. But where is the lamb for burnt offering? Uh, and when you look at that verse, you see Abraham, my guess is that Abraham had the fire in his heart burning for the Lord. In Genesis 22, God told Abraham to take his son Isaac to the mountains to become a human sacrifice. They arrived at the location and Isaac did not realize that he was going to be a sacrifice. Isaac and you, he, they had three things to have a sacrifice. Every time you want to have, they wanted to have a sacrifice, three things. They had wood, they had fire, and they had a lamb. And this time, Isaac doesn't see the lamb. In Abraham's life, obviously our guess there was the fire and the wood, but no lamb, and God provided the lamb. Now, if you look at most Christians around us, we can invert this question and ask. We have the wood. The cross of Calvary is the wood. We have the lamb. Jesus Christ is the lamb of God. I have a question for you. Where is the fire? Where is the Holy Ghost, the Holy Spirit? Where is the zeal? This is what is missing in our churches today. We have everything. We have the cross. Christ has died for us. We have the wood. Christ has died on the cross for our lives. But where is the fire? This time, we are not asking where is the lamb. The lamb is available. The question today in our time is, where is the fire? The question that Isaac is asking in this day is, where is the fire? Where is the fire? Um, I love to read the books, the book of Revelation. In fact, of recent, I read through the churches in the book of Revelation, and those seven churches are found in Turkey. A few years ago, I had the opportunity of practically going to Ephesus and see the church in Ephesus in Turkey and the ruins. And one of the, miser the most miserable experiences you will ever have in Turkey is to realize that the seven churches John talks about are actually where in Turkey. And today, Turkey is as cold as the fridge in terms of Christianity and spirituality. It's all gone. It's a miserable experience. I pray that our nations will never become like 
Turkey. I pray that America will stay on a fire for Jesus Christ. I pray that you will continue to seek the Lord, that forever we will have a candle of God's fire burning in our lives. In the book of Revelation chapter 3 verse 15 to 17 says, I know your deeds, that you're neither cold nor hot. I wish you were one or the other, 16. So because you're lukewarm, neither hot or cold, I'm about to spit you out of my mouth. And that's what I saw in Ephesus about two years ago. Ephesus, God spit them out of his mouth. It's now runes and cold and unimputed a city in Turkey and not only Ephesus, but the, re the rest of the other six churches. 17, you say, I am rich. I have acquired wealth and do not have and, and do not need a thing. Do you not realize that you are wicked, pitiful, poor, blind, and naked? He says, it is very easy for people to lose their fire for God. Our fire is usually lost when we start concentrating on us and our problems and our needs instead of concentrating on God. And I hear this all the time. When people are talking about their needs, their problems, their, instead of talking and looking to God, then going to church becomes the thing of convenience. When I feel like I can wake up, I can't go to church. Uh, people in my community, people start coming to church late, 30 minutes later. People are not bothered by church other than Sunday. So every Sunday they go to church and they become Sunday Christians. Another person called them submarine Christians. Basically, on, on Sunday evening, Monday morning, they go down. Okay, and Sunday morning they appear and they come to the church. We also call them submarine Christians. Attendance in church becomes low and prayer meetings diminish. Uh, the Bible, in the Bible, such a people are called lukewarm believers. They are neither hot, they are not called, they are lukewarm. Warm. They are lukewarm. My prayer is that we'll be a church on fire for Jesus, for God, and we'll be fired up by the Holy Spirit because he's actually with us. He's in our midst. He's just waiting for each of us to respond to him. Now, let me tell you, lukewarmness is a dangerous situation. You don't want to be a lukewarm Christian. Let me tell you about lukewarmness. When someone is not cold and is not warm, is in between. This is what happens. What happens is that lukewarmness, did you, ever, did you know that lukewarmness is a breeding space for bacteria? When things are lukewarm, they become a breeding space for bacteria. And as a result, lukewarm Christians can easily be a breeding ground for sin. And gradually, people start sliding away before we know that they are actually sliding away. This is a dangerous attitude. It's a dangerous situation to be in. Jesus calls us to respond in the power of the Holy Spirit he has put in our lives. The church on fire. We are praying that we will this year be a church on fire. I am praying that I'll be a Christian on fire. I've been praying these days trying to find my fire. I have found out that to be able to keep the fire, you have to be always sensitive to the temperature of your spiritual life. 
just like you take uh, the temperature of your body to determine whether you don't have COVID. You know, in some areas, uh, now before you enter the, the church, before you enter a location, they want to measure your temperature at the airport to make sure your temperature is good enough for the journey. Friends, uh, you want to measure your spiritual temperature this year at the beginning of the year to make sure your temperature is good for the journey. The church on fire. The church on the fire is a praying church. A believer on fire is a believer who prays. Prayer needs to be a continuous aspect of the church and God's people because the prayer brings the fire. The New Testament church prayed. The early church prayed. They prayed all the time. Friends, let me tell you, in our these days, we do services. For them, they prayed. For them, it wasn't just about putting on a service. It was about prayer. When you read in the book of Acts, chapter 1, verse 14, they all joined together constantly in prayer along with the women. Acts, chapter 2, Verse 42, they devoted themselves the, to, the, to the apostles' teaching and to the fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. Acts chapter 4, verse 31, after they prayed, the place where they were meeting was shaken. Man, that's the kind of prayer I want. Like uh, it begins to shake him things. Sometimes I tell people at my church, when you come to the church, I want you to go back. I, I don't want you to go back the way you came. You should never go back from the church the way you came. If you came in crying, I want you to go back laughing. And if you came in laughing, I want you to go back crying. And if you came in without hair, maybe you go back with the hair. I mean, I'm just saying, you, you go back a different every time you come in the house of God. And these guys, come on, the place was shaking. Can you imagine us praying here till this place begins to shake him? Acts chapter 7, look at, this is all in one book, 759. While they were stoning him, Stephen prayed. They were circulated with prayer. Acts chapter 12, verse 5, Peter was kept in prison, but the church was praying for him. Acts chapter 12, verse 12, when, when this had dawned on him, he went to the house of Mary, the mother of John, also called Mark, where many people had gathered and were praying at home. Acts chapter 16, verse 25. About midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God. That's why this church had power and had fire, because this church was praying continuously all the time. Friends, I want to download on you a burden of prayer. I am praying that you catch the burden of prayer, that the burden for prayer will be so much on your heart that you don't have a way out. You only have to get on your knees and pray. What happened when the church prayed? Number one, the Holy Spirit ignited a fire in their lives. When the church prays, the Spirit of God ignites a fire. Now, it's good to be a studying church. I love the American church. I went to American seminaries. The American church is a studying church. We study 
the word. We break down the word. I think that is what I credit to the American church. Every American pastor has multiple concordances and dictionaries in his library, including believers in the church. Possibly some of you who are seated here have degrees in theology. That is beautiful. But I want to say that on prayer, we want to on, on the word, we want to add on prayer because if we just do the word without prayer, without a constant seeking of God, we can easily be just the people of the word without the spirit. For the church to be alive, we want to have sound doctrine and theology and break the word of God properly. But we also want to be the kind of people who are constantly praying and seeking the face of God. And then someone will say, but why do I I pray I have everything I need. They, the same church of Ephesus, they had everything they need. You don't pray because you are needed. You don't pray because you need material things. You pray because you are spiritually needed. You need more of his spirit, more of his power, more of his grace. You pray because you want to be in relationship with your God. You want to pursue God. You want to chase after God. You want to walk with him and you want to have a strong walk with him. Prayer is not just for the poor. Prayer is for all who are poor in the spirit. The Holy Spirit ignited a fire in their lives. Acts chapter 2 verse 1 to 4. When the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. Suddenly, a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to sit on each of them. And all of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. Fire came upon their lives because they prayed. Remember these people were waiting and because they were waiting in prayer the spirit of God came upon them. Now this is something I've been realizing these days in the US. Yesterday we went to a restaurant and they told us the waiting line is two hours to get a meal. We went to another restaurant and they said it's about 45 minutes here. And we kept looking for restaurant to go to. But I found out that actual Americans could wait for two hours or an hour to get into a restaurant to eat physical food, but they can't wait for another hour in the church to eat spiritual food. Come on, we need to put things in perspective. If we are waiting at a restaurant, we might as well wait in the house of God. I believe that sometimes the Spirit of God comes in the church after we have left. I said, you know, you invited me to come. I'm here, but I don't see you. Hello? Number two. The church on fire became powerful and bold. You can see the fire of the Holy Spirit, the way the church worships. Man, this worship this morning was fabulous. was beautiful. was beautiful worship. The worship leaders are to worship and the preachers are to preach. You can see the fire and the tongues of fire breaking through that attitude. And the Bible says after they prayed, Acts chapter 4 verse 31, the place where they were meeting was shaken and they were filled with the Holy Spirit and spoke the word of God boldly. Friends, let me tell you. We cannot depend on man-made excitement to get the power of God. No. For many of us, 
Worship stops when the drums and the keyboards stop. And when they stop, people stop worshiping. Did you realize that sometimes the drums and the worship leaders and the equipment and the technology overwhelms us that we don't worship, we become spectators? And I'm saying true worship begins with you. True worship begins with the congregation. True worship begins with me being engaged in worshiping God when I get into this space. When I get into this space, this becomes my father's house. And in my father's house, I want to find liberty and a fire in the Holy Spirit. I want to be bold in my worship. You know, people are bold in a stadium. They are bold on a bold on a sports game in the basketball game. And then when they come in the house of God, they are so cold. What's wrong? You were yesterday, you were at Baylor and you enjoyed the game and you were shouting at every corner of the stadium and you are back into the house of God and God says, Where are you? Saying, I don't know if I'm here. When the Spirit of God started moving, what happened? Number one, souls were added to the church. Church growth became automatic. Acts chapter 2, verse 47, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people, and the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. Like I said, when the church is on fire, people are going to come and see the fire, and they'll give their lives to Jesus. When the church is on fire, the church worship becomes inspiring. Man, I want to worship and cry. I want to worship and dance. I want to worship and laugh. I want to worship and clap. I want to worship and experience the power of God. I want to worship like a drunkard person. You know, someone who is a drunkard, you make a friend. You, uh, you go find your grandpa who doesn't dance. When you give him two bottles of wine, uh, wait a little bit, the old man will begin to, to, to dance because he's intoxicated. Okay, man, I want to be intoxicated by the Spirit of God that I am no longer ashamed of those who are around me. I'm on fire for Jesus Christ. And listen to what the Bible says in the book of Ephesians, chapter 5, verse 18 and 19. Don't get, do not get drunk on wine which leads to debauchery, what happens? Instead, instead, be filled with the Spirit, speaking with psalms and hymns and songs from the Spirit. Sing and make music from your heart. That's what happens. Music comes from your heart. But let me remind us that it is it's, it's in the community with other Christians that we experience the spirit-filled life. We can never experience it alone. That's why the Bible says, speak to one another with psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. If there is any moment and a time for us to be put on fire and to experience God is when we gather like this. That's why gatherings like this are momentum moments for us to catch the fire of God. And if we are going to catch the fire of God, we need to make this moment every time we gather to make sense and to be an experience where we are on fire with him. Now we can have the best musicians, we can have the best equipment, but till we pray and be filled with the Holy Spirit, it's just another Sunday band. Okay? It's just another musical morning. I don't want another musical morning. I want a Holy Ghost moment. I want a Holy Spirit blessing upon 
my life. Number three, when the church is on fire, the Holy Spirit ignites power for missions. It's like you don't have to beg people to go on a missionary trip. I remember as a younger man when I gave my life to Christ at age 17. Back in 1984, I, I was so cold and frozen. And one moment when I was praying alone in the house, I experienced a new day in my prayer life. I'd never experienced before I was struggling to read my Bible, I was struggling to live a righteous life, I was struggling to pray, and one night I was praying, something phenomenal entered into my prayer life, and instantly my prayer life was empowered, and I would pray and pray and pray for an hour without even realizing that it's an hour. And the following few weeks, my life was so empowered. Everywhere I went, I wanted to tell people about Jesus. And very quickly, I was on the streets telling people about Jesus. And I've been telling people about Jesus since then. I have never stopped. Over 30 years, I am still telling people about Jesus. I still have the fire, and I want to keep the fire, and I want to stay in the fire. <laughs> Hallelujah. Acts chapter 1, verse 8. But you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in Judea, in Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. That's what happens. When you receive the fire, you become unstoppable. When you receive the fire, you become a witness in the community. You're not ashamed of the gospel, for the gospel is the power of God to bring salvation. In Judea and Samaria, all over the earth. Friends, this year, we need to ask God to put a new fire in our lives. Yes, we have the cross, we have the lamb, but we need a fire. And I want to finish with this one. The perfect condition to catch the fire. What is a perfect condition to catch the fire? In the book of Exodus, chapter 3, verse 1, uh, you're going to see the perfect condition to catch the fire. Now, Moses was attending the flock of Jethro with his father-in-law, the priest of Midian, and he led the flock to the first side of the wilderness and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. There the angel of the Lord appeared to him in flames of fire from within a bush. Moses saw that though the bush was on fire, it didn't burn up. So Moses thought, I'll go over and see this strange sight, why the bush does not burn up. When Moses saw that he had gone over to look, God called him. When the Lord saw that he had gone over to look, God called him from within the bush, Moses, Moses. Now, First thing I want you to notice in this location, where Moses encountered the fire of God. I want you to notice that it, it doesn't say that Moses encountered the fire when he was lying next to a green pasture, next to Karahari, uh, um, place down here in Round Rock, surrounded by all the swimming pools and bubbling water and is surrounded by some beautiful flowers. It doesn't say that he encountered the fire of God in a five-star resort hotel receiving messages over television. The Bible says that when Moses encountered the fire of God, he was in a desert. Underline that. Best conditions to catch the fire. Moses was in 
the desert. In fact, let me take a step further. The Bible actually says that Moses was on the back side of the desert when he encountered the fire of God. Now, how many of you know that the desert is a dry place? It's a thirsty place. And in that thirsty, lonely, dry place, God sent a fire for Moses. The best conditions for you to catch a fire is when you are going through a crisis. The best situation for you to catch the fire is when you are going through difficulty. The best place for you to catch a fire is when you are actually wondering where is God. And in that moment, God appears to you. If you are in that situation, and you are thirsty, and you are hungry, and you are in a crisis, and you are in a spiritual difficulty, not even a physical difficulty, but a spiritual difficulty, spiritual dilemma, you are trying to connect the gap, and the gap is not connecting. I have good news for you. You are in the right place to catch the fire because you are in a dry place. And in that dry place, it's easy to catch the fire. Let's catch the fire. Father, we come before you. Lord, some of us are in a desert place. Some of us have been in this desert place for 40 years. Father God, some of us have promises from you for revival, just like Moses. Promises that one day you'll bring deliverance, and we haven't seen deliverance. Father, we pray this year that you will invite us to a burning push, and that you will begin a new fire in our lives that's unstoppable. Father, I pray that you begin a new work in this place. I pray your blessing upon this church and upon this community that this will be a well of joy, a fire of revival to follow upon this place that people come from all over the city to experience the goodness of our God. We do ask you at the beginning of this year in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. God bless you.